Um, part of this project is that we are forming um, some more bird monitoring organizations uh, or groups, I guess, to, to monitor particular pieces of land that we're gonna be doing some restoration on. And, um, and we're also um, looking for people who would want to help mentor young folks in learning how to bird and participate in community science. Um, so if you are interested, please uh, send a chat to Maya Anthony, um, M-A-Y-A, -A, Maya Anthony, just uh, look for her in there. Send your contact information to her and we will um, be back in touch with you about um, forming these monitoring groups and mentoring possibilities uh, for, for young folks. Um, along, so those lines, along those lines, Jim, if you go on the website to the about section, it has an email address in there for me, rt at rioandbudobirds.org. And you can email me there. I keep a list of birders in Dixon and a list of birders in Taos. And Absolutely. wherever you're from, I can put you on one of those lists. Great, okay. Well, so to jump in, um, just to recap. So my name is Jim O'Donnell. I'm with the Taos Land Trust. Um, Robert Templeton, as you all know, we, will be um, teaching this class. We um, at the Taos Land Trust, we're working with a, um, in a, under a grant and in cooperation with Cornell Lab of Ornithology um, to expand birding uh, knowledge and opportunity in our areas. Um, as well as citizen science opportunities. But that is also tied to um, a, a goal of eventually um, yeah. working with our conservation easement holders um, and other land owning partners to do uh, bird habitat restoration. And so one of the things that we wanna be doing over the next year is gathering baseline data on some of these pieces of land that we will be looking at for, um, for habitat restoration in the future. Um, so, so, that, so this course is a part of that project. Um, another word I was, I meant to have um, the last, last week's course loaded and available online by today, but technical difficulties <laughs> did not allow that to happen. So, I will, um, I'll keep working on that and try to have the recording of session number one up and session number two up in just a few days. So, um, and then we'll let everybody know about that. And those will be available on into the future. So um, definitely hit me up with any questions in the chat and we will stop on occasion to, uh, to go over questions um, and otherwise, I'm going to turn it over to Robert. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, you've got to enable me to do that. Yes, I do. There we go. All right. Let me get things adjusted here. Okay. Uh, can you see my face up in the upper right hand corner? Okay. All right. Okay. So probably the worst way to have a bird watching workshop is on Zoom. Because if we were doing this in person, we would have already spent quite a bit of time outside looking and listening and describing and doing all those things. Uh, and a couple of things came up for me this week when I was thinking about that. And one of them is, uh, I just thought I'd do a couple of short uh, anecdotes just to give you a feeling of, the, of how birding happens sometimes. I've been doing a early morning bird count once a week I started it in March when COVID started and I would go out four minutes before sunrise every day 
not every day, once a week, and for 10 minutes, do a point count. I would just record every species I heard or saw during that time. I'd usually get 10, 12 species in that 10 minutes time. And I've been, I've continued doing that. And I'm gonna continue to doing that throughout the year because it will be one of those things which will reveal to me the seasons of the years because the mix of birds species that are there will vary with the seasons. Anyway, I was doing the last one on this Sunday and, and my, the theme of this anecdote is simply surprises. You just don't know what you're gonna encounter when you go out there. I was expecting juncos, I got them. I was expecting white crowned sparrows, I got them. I was expecting towns and solids. I, was expe I got everything I was expecting. But just as I was turning to leave at the very end of the count, I looked up and I had a bald eagle fly, flying over. And that's an unusual uh, experience for me at my particular location. And it's unusual at four minutes before sunrise, or maybe it's not because I'm not out there every day, but that kind of thing can happen. The other, the other short anecdote was that my wife, Karen and I were off to the store to pick up groceries the other day. And on the way back, I'm coming back and I notice over on the right-hand side of the road, there's a little bird called a brown creeper crawling up the trunk and the brown creeper goes spiraling up the trunk. It crawls up the trunk, but it goes around the tree in a clockwise or counterclockwise motion, depending on your perspective. And when it gets to the top of that trunk, it flies to the next tree at the bottom and does the same spiraling motion up. You don't get to see brown creepers that often. And that was a, that was a, a nice little thing. I, mean, I know that a bunch of people in Taos saw a migratory group of ring-billed ring gulls in the parking lot of Albertsons this fall. So you just never know where things are gonna crop up. In fact, someone that uh, was on this, uh, Patsy Scott that was on this uh, workshop last week called, she had a road runner right near her house, right near the storyteller theater. So you just don't know what's gonna pop up. So in that, in that uh, vein, I, over in today's workshop, there's a thing, I called this two anecdotes in the link, the joy of birding. There's a lot of North America with Jason Ward. Now this is a New York City birder, my friend in New York, who we bird a lot together, who, who has cityislandbirds.org. He sent me this link. It's a, it's a, this particular video, I, it's six minutes long. It can give you a real, really good feeling of what it's like to be out birding if you haven't been out birding with a group. So check that out. It's on the workshop outlines and exercises pages right there. Okay, just a quick review from workshop one. The two main topics that we covered were family groupings of species, the fact that families have shared characteristics and identification to the family level is a useful skill. And we also call, covered seasonal groupings where we looked at migration and saw how the mix of species changes throughout the year. And I wanna go over for just a moment and take a look at range maps. One last time here for a second. Well, it won't be the last time. We're gonna keep looking at them all day. But I just wanted to point out in detail, I might've gone over this a little quickly last time. The range maps on this website, in every case, the purple means they are present in that area all year. So this is a black cap chickadee. It's present wherever it's purple all year long. There we are right there at the bottom of its range. Here's the Rufus hummingbird. The red refers to breeding areas, the yellow to migration paths, and the blue to wintering grounds. So many maps will have at least, all maps will have at least one color. Many will have three, and sometimes the third one will be the yellow, but sometimes you'll just have the breeding 
the all year, and the blue. So in this situation, all of these birds that breed up in here squeeze down into the purple and blue areas during the winter. And then many of them migrate up here. If you've uh, ever seen large migratory flocks of a great place to see migratory flocks is Airport Road in Santa Fe, out below the airport. You can see flocks of 400, 500 robins as they're getting ready to take off to fly north. So a little detail about those, the range maps there. And of course, one of the things that we talked about was that these seasonal groupings, they help you to reduce the number of species that you might be considering for a particular bird ID. So you can review all of that. It's all there. And if you go to the exercises of workshop one, it has the readings, and these all refer back to the details of what we covered. These readings here, go to migration view, these, it's all there on the website. I'm not presenting anything in these workshops that you won't be able to go back and read about or uh, review on your own. Uh, we might just see if there's any, if there's a one or two questions right at that point. Are we still question free? We are question free. Everybody understands everything so far. Okay, fantastic. These are smart well, listen, I've, I have an experienced teacher that I've taught at many different levels. And I know that just because people say they, they understand doesn't mean they do, but we'll take it at this time that everybody understands. All right, here's the main thrust of today. An essential skill in identifying birds is developing the habits of describing everything you're seeing. We talked about that extensively last week when we talked about the, obs the cycle of observation where you observe, describe, observe, describe, observe, describe, look at a reference, observe, describe, look at a reference, observe, describe, look at a reference, oh, I got it, write it down, write down some details about it, notate its song, on and on and on, send the record up to eBird. So what we're gonna to do today is to look at some concepts and terminology that can help you develop those skills of description because they're, they're critical. So the first thing we're gonna look at is describing birds visually. So if you go to the website and you go to identifying birds, and you skip down to what? We've already asked, we already know where we are. We're at the Rio Fernando wetlands. We know when we are right now because it's winter time. So we can look at the range maps and see what's of it, what are available. And now we're gonna ask the question, well, what? What are we actually seeing? What are we, what are we looking at? How can you describe it? So let's talk about visual detail. Now I put this picture up first of all because I, it, this picture blows me out. I mean, what is this? And how beautiful is this? And this is a scaled quail. This was out behind my house one day. And the thing I wanna point out is this. There's the bill, there's the eye, and there, are the tarsus and toes. And other than that, everything we're looking at is feathers. There's nothing visible to us other than feathers except for the bill, eye, and the feet. Okay, so there's many features that, that distinguish Birds, overall size, that's something you have to think about. The beak, the size, the shape, the color, the length and color of legs and feet, eye color, relative tail length, wing shape and flight style behavior, all of these things come at you at once. You're looking at this bird and you're thinking, hmm, what is that bird doing? We'll talk about that in a minute. As you observe birds, 
get in the habit of noticing those qualities, sometimes just one or two of those features may turn out to be the key to an identification. However, since most of what you see on the bird are its feathers, learning to describe those feathers is really helpful. So that's what we're gonna do. Most field guides have a page or two on the parts of a bird. Here's the Sibley's field guide. Can you see that? Surely you can see it, it's right in front of my face. Those are some pages from the Sibley's field guide that give you some ideas about feather groups and such. There's another very strong learning thing in the Peterson field guide, which is silhouettes. The silhouettes of birds, just the, the sheer posture and shape of birds can sometimes give you an identification. So check out any field guides you have. They'll name parts of birds and they may show silhouettes as well. All of those things very helpful. Okay, so let's jump in here. What have we got? What we have here is, I believe that this is a, a male Western bluebird. And here are some common things, some common names of parts of the bird that birders refer to all the time. There's a crown, top of your head, it's just like your crown. The nape, the back of your neck, just like the back of your neck. The throat. Now the throat is a very important one. If this throat was this same color and it went all the way up to the bill, this would not be a Western bluebird. This would be an Eastern bluebird. So the small details like that become very important. So here we have the uh, mantle, which we'll see better on another picture. The mantle is like the, your body between your shoulders on the backside. So these re wings raise up and out, but you can still see the mantle back here. We'll see that better on a different picture. The breast, of course, is often very diagnostic. The side, which sometimes is, refers to the upper part of the side, and the flank, which refers to the lower part, you see, you hear people using those interchangeably. If they're talking flank or side, they're talking about what's over here next to where the wing sits. The belly, the vent. The vent is down kind of behind the legs. This is where the sexual organs are. This is where the, the bird uh, defecates, et cetera. And this interesting place here, the undertail covert. So the tail feathers are sticking out of the body of the bird. And over those, over there's over tail and under them, there are other feathers which make a good air and weather seal against the roots of those, the, the uh, I don't know what the word is that I want, but the, the end of the feather that goes into the body. And that's what the undertail coverts are. So I think we covered everything there. We're gonna recover some of these things. So then we move on to a Townsend's warbler. This is a Townsend's warbler that was, this picture was taken at the Rio Fernando wetlands. So again, we have the throat, we have the breast, we have, what I've said is the side and or flank. You'll find it defined different way. The belly. So the breast comes first and then the belly. And many times you'll have a bird where you make a distinction between what's on the breast and what's on the belly. Again, the vent, the undertail coverts, the mantle, you can see it a little better here. If these wings were to spread out, that mantle would still be visible in between the wings if you were looking down on the bird. Very important one is this supercilium or the eyebrow. Sometimes that's a critical identification mark on many different birds. So this, whatever line is directly above the eye. And sometimes people refer to the auricular patch 
and the hearing uh, parts of the bird are in here and often it's of a different color or has a little more finer feathers or some, some kind of little shape. Any questions in the chat box yet? Nope, so far we're, we're doing good. All right. Okay, now here's another bird. Here's the Nashville warbler, again by Bob Fredericks. Bob Fredericks is a person that is in South Texas part of the year and in Taos part of the year, and he's a really good photographer and a really good bird watcher. Robert, we and did get, just get one. The... Sorry to interrupt. We did just yeah. get one question um, sure. about the wing bars on the last bird. Oh, I skipped them. Okay. Good question. All right, so the wings, the feathers of the wings insert into the bones of the bird wings. So you have this upper part of the wing and the lower part of the wing and the lowest part of the wing. And where those uh, feathers insert into the bone, there are other feathers that make a good cover, aerodynamic and weatherproofing cover on those feathers. And that's what causes these wing bars. So these are coverts that are covering some of the wing feathers. These are coverts that are covering a different set of the wing feathers. Okay. We could get, we could spend an hour on the wings, but we're not going to today. Yeah, you'll, you'll ever, you'll get into that. Is that, does that answer the question? Somebody can nod to it. Okay, good. Yeah, I'll holler if I skip something like that. Okay, number one, an eye ring. There are some birds that can look almost identical except one has an eye ring and one doesn't. Sometimes the eye ring will extend forward into the laurel part, which I did not name, but it's the part between the bill and the eye. And it looks like a spectacle, it looks like a eyeglass. So there's all kinds of, of uh, eye rings. Again, the throat, the breast, the belly, the vent. You'll notice here, the breast and the belly have yellow, but the vent is white. And the undertail coverts are, they, I think they're white. They, they look lighter than the rest of the bird. And here we have wing bars again, but here we have weak or faint wing bars. And sometimes that's a distinguishing factor. You might have very pronounced wing bars or you might have very faint wing bars. It just depends. And it also varies by season because at the end of the breeding season, some of these adult birds that have been raising young, they are on the edge of death. They have worked themselves so hard. Their feathers are worn. Some of them are broken. So some uh, details like that, some edges of feathers can be worn away by the end of the season. And then they molt and get new feathers. Right, and moon. that's related to a question we got, just got was yep. that do the coverts, coverts molt and aren't always visible? Uh, well, there is no answer to that for all species. Uh, there are books that you can, if you go to, a, to the kind of reference books that are used for bird banding, you can find out the sequence of molting so that most birds molt in such a way that they are never flightless and that they can, they can do what they need to do. There are some birds that, are, that, can, that put themselves into flightless states for some periods of time, but most birds do not. So, what you may see is a sequencing where one feather gets replaced, another feather gets replaced, another feather gets replaced here. You, you are in most cases not going to see them all missing at one time. And it, and it really depends. There are many different plumages. There's, there's the juvenile plumage, there's the first basic plumage, there's a second plume that goes on and on depending on the species. And the details of that are far beyond what we can discuss here today. And uh, you, you, can, you really have to look at each bird individually 
and, and see what's going on. You will see, sometimes you'll see a, a turkey vulture up in the soaring around or a hawk or a, 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 a raven. And you'll see there's a couple of feathers missing. Usually it'll be symmetrical. One on each wing will be missing. They're in the middle of a molt. Does that answer that question? Robert, is there, a, is there a practical purpose for the eye ring or is it purely decorative? Um, can I answer that question? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sure there are purposes, but uh, okay. When you get into purposes with birds, you get immediately into ev evolutionary biology. You get into the question of why is anything shaped the way it's shaped? It's shaped by the fact that birds need energy to, to live and energy is available in different places in different habitats. So if a bird evolves in a certain habitat, it's used to getting its energy in some place. And so how a bird looks often has to do with that. Uh, also species, if you get into the definition of a species, these are birds that can successfully breed together. That is they can breed and, and the and the young are able to also breed and, and produce a viable young. So this is also a way that birds can be distinguished from each other. But uh, I, can't, I, I can't give you a simple answer to that. Is that good enough? All right. Let's move on. This glorious photo taken by another great Taos birder, Tom Jacklin, who has a knack for finding rarities. He's, that's because he's slow. He birds slowly. I'm a very slow bird. And sometimes people are like, let's get out of here. And I'm still looking. I am ready to get out of there. And Tom Jacklin's still looking. And he'll turn up rare birds. So this photo, I mean, what's not to like about this yellow rumped warbler, or this male in full, full spring plumage? Okay, there we've got an eye ring. Notice, there's an eye ring, there's an eye ring. This is a complete eye ring. This is a broken eye ring. Here we have a rump patch visible. So you're looking at the rump of the bird, you're looking at the over tail coverts, essentially. You're looking at the feathers on the rump of the bird that cover the insertion points of the tail feathers. The wings, this is like if you were holding your arms down behind you and your back and they weren't touching, you'd see some of your back below, between the wings sticking down. Some wing bar action going on here. Here, I've said that this is the flank because it's down low and I've said that this is the side. We've got two things going on here. We've got this black streaking going down from the, on the side down into the flank. We've got this yellow mark. This is all on the body. The wing starts here. This is all on the body. And of course, we got this incredible <laughs> throat patch in blaring yellow. There's a, uh, a different version of the yellow rumped warbler, uh, which doesn't have yellow, has white there. It's very common in our area, you'll see it. And this guy happens to have a wonderful crown patch. So, I mean, how, how many birds like this do you have to see before you think, you know, I'd like to see these things. This is, this is, to me, this is, this is glorious. So, some terminology to think about when you're trying to describe birds. Here's some more. Masks, common yellow throat. This was taken right under the bridge at Rio Fernando wetlands. 
got a black mask, the eye in the middle of the black mask. Here's the loggerhead shrike, black mask, black eye. I've seen a loggerhead shrike on the fences just to the west of Rio Fernando wetlands. This cedar waxwing, oh, I mean, this can't be real. Tell me this isn't real. Look at the yellow tips on the tail and look at that mask lined in white above and below. That's one beautiful bird. You'll see them flocking together in large flocks. So masks, that's the category. I mentioned eyebrows. Here's a red-breasted nuthatch with a very prominent eyebrow right over the eye. Here's a Buick's wren with an eyebrow. If you are trying to distinguish between the Buick's wren, the house wren, and the marsh wren that are all found at Rio Fernando wetlands, that eye line will be a big help to you. It will. It will help you. You'll see, if you see a bird with some barring on the tail, there it is. So a little more terminology here. What are we looking at? We're looking at a yellow throat and breast. We're looking at a white belly, little bit of coloring and a little bit of yellow in the undertail coverts. Beautiful white breast here. Just beauty everywhere there. Oh my gosh, this beautiful brown throat, breast, belly, undertail coverts. Rump patch. One time on a bird walk, there was a northern flicker on a tree about, I don't know, it could have been an eighth of a mile away. And this one birder didn't believe me when I said it was a northern flicker, but when you're looking at a bird and, the, and here's the tree and the bird is aligned with the tree and it's showing that rump patch, that's all you need. In this particular place, it's gonna be a northern flicker. So sometimes a rump patch can tell you all about it. Northern Harrier flying around over the fields. If you're gonna see this around the Rio Fernando, you're probably gonna see it in the farm fields just below Baca Park and it'll be sweeping along, flying just above the ground, six feet, eight feet, 12 feet above the ground. It might rise up to go over a fence and then come back down low as it hunts. But that rump patch, very prominent. Cliff swallow, they're flying all over. They're aerialists, they're getting their insects as they're on the wing. You may not be able to see all of this detail up here, but you may very well see the yellow rump patch. And with the swallows that are here, at, this mo at, this, at that point in time, that'll be enough to tell you that this is a cliff swallow. Central spot, central breast spot. This is a song sparrow, streaky breast, streaking going down the sides, flanks, and a dark central spot. Here's a clear-breasted bird with a dark central spot, the lark sparrow. Sparrow face head patterns. Whenever you're looking at sparrows, you're gonna to want to look at the head patterns. Can be very distinctive. Here is a median crown stripe, this little stripe here. Here's another one, here's a median crown stripe. This is a, an adult here that does not have that crown stripe. Some birder out there is saying, no, no, that's not right. I'm gonna just go with that for right now. Uh, this is a white crown sparrow. Notice it's got a light colored bill. That's an important factor for wintertime sparrow identification in, our, in this location. And it's got beautiful, supercilium here, the eyebrow, and it's got a black eye line, a posterior eye line, it's posterior to the eye. Here's the, the lark sparrow. This is the same bird that we were looking at here. 
This is another lark sparrow, incredible head pattern, very distinctive. Here's the brewer sparrow, clear breast. Hey, forked tail, forked tail, that can be a mark. That can be an important identifier. Savannah sparrow, forked tail again. Oh, it's got a central spot, oh, maybe. And streaks on the side, pretty fine streaking. This is pretty finely streaked and this is pretty finely streaked. Oh, we missed the Lincoln sparrow, has this buff color running through the streaking on the breast. In our location, that's all you need that, you got it. You might not notice in this photo, but this actually, actually has yellow in the front of the supercilium, in front of the eyebrow. So details, 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 details. Describing details will, will be a great aid. That's, that's, that becomes, that becomes one of the main things you do. Here's a detail that's that's very interesting. These this is the hairy woodpecker, and this is the downy woodpecker. Their plumage is virtually identical. There are some marks on a downy which you rarely see down here that can separate them. And I will admit this one is a couple of inches larger than this one. But in the field, size sometimes is very difficult to tell. But this bird provides a way to measure its bill. If you see one of these two birds, the hairy or the downy woodpecker, if the length of the bill is approximately equal to the length, the, the measure of the head from the back of the bill to the back of the head, it's a hairy, big bill, hairy. If it is a very diminutive bill and the bill length is short compared to this measure, it's a downy. It's that simple, usually. Sometimes there'll be one that you'll go in between and go, I don't know, I don't know. And we'll talk about next week what you do when you can't make the distinction between two birds like that. Okay, let's, if there's a question, I'll take that and then we'll go on to some sounds. Um, let's see, just have one. Um, going back to the eye ring, um, someone was wondering if the eye ring <clears throat> makes their eye look open even when it's closed. And I'm assuming, you know, in terms of a, a protection against predators. I don't know. That's a that's a that's a great hypothesis. Um, well, that uh, you may come up with some papers written about that very idea. If you Google "purpose of bird eye ring," you'll come up with things. Uh, somewhere in the notes for this, somewhere <laughs> somewhere in the notes for this lecture, I say, don't overlook Wikipedia as a source of information for birds. The Wikipedia bird accounts for individual species sometimes are amazingly complete and detailed, and they will have lots of references. So that's it, that's it for questions. I think you know the main point that you're getting to us here is is learning all these um, the pieces of the bird, the parts of the bird that help with the identification and becoming really familiar with those parts. Exactly, and. You know, you can memorize them if you want to, or you could just keep them in mind and you'll develop them. You'll hear other birders say, oh, look at that eye ring, or hey, oh, oh look, look at, oh, no, that can't be that. That's got wing bars. You know, you, it'll come. Describe the bird in as much detail as you can. It, it, it'll all come together. It's a result of evolutionary biology, but it's not evolutionary biology. You don't have to know genetics to, to reap the benefits of the genetics. Sound, Debbie, yeah. Um, uh, Debbie wants to know if you are going to discuss bill-shaped purpose, bill-shaped slash purpose as an identifying mark. Um, <clears throat> throat> well, certainly it's, it's related to that. I mean, woodpeckers have the shape of a bill that they have. 
because they are hammering. You know, they're they're making holes in trees. Flycatchers have a a hook on the end because they're catching uh, insects in the air. Uh, finches crack seeds, so they have a certain shape of the bill. That, that's a very important topic. I don't have time to cover it today, but it's something that is it's critical. I think last week in the exercises, I asked people to go through and look at the bills of different families and look at the bill shapes. And we will be talking about this too in the last lecture again, when we talk about habitat restoration and uh, the fact that the, the morphology, the, the shape of a bird is not separate from its habitat. And the habitat is not separate from the bird. They shape each other in all kinds of ways. So when, uh, when a, uh, <clears throat> uh, pinon jays, jay hides uh, nuts in the ground, they plant forests. And then the forests provide pinons for the jays, and that kind of thing. We'll get into more of that. Robert, that just leads me to a question about, um, do we, know of or have um, any science on the uh, how birds may change in their morphology based on um, environmental change of their habitats um, or do they you know as, a, as an evolutionary adaptation um, that we can see um, after a couple generations it turns out that these kinds of variations can be seen after a couple or three generations. Uh, uh, you know, the desert species, you know, species in the West are pale com com compared in general to species in the East. You take the same species, put it in the East, it's got a different coloration than it does in the West and so forth. Yeah, I, I mean, the, I'll use the word phenotype. The phenotype describes the entire morphology, the shape, everything about the bird. There is a, ter there is a term called extended phenotype. And what that means is you cannot separate out the bird from its habitat. So all, those, all of, the, pre all of the, uh, the available energy in the habitat shapes that bird. And the bird, because of how it interacts, with the seeds and the insects of that habitat affect that habitat. I think I keep saying the same thing over and over, but. <laughs> okay, I think we have to move on. <clears throat> it's a quarter to five now. All right, now uh, you, can, you can read this section. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you part of it on sound detail. I claim that learning to recognize birds by their sounds is an inevitable outcome of spending time in the field looking and listening. It happens. You may not be spectacular at it. You may not know a lot of birds, but you will start, and you probably already do recognize some birds by sound. I said it's not quick, but eventually, the bird sounds start to evoke some image in your mind as to who's making that sound. Here's some strategies. Study recordings. You can read this, get some details on that. Take it slow, Cho choose a few common species at that time of year and focus on those. Add species as it becomes comfortable. And here's one, I think, really important part. When you hear a sound you don't recognize, focus on listening to the tonal quality as well as the note by note details. Get the sound, this is the thing I think I said last time, when, you're, when your mother calls you on the phone, you don't have to ask if it's your mother. And that is a big part of bird song recognition because the songs vary as we'll see in a minute, but the tonal qualities don't vary as much. So anyway, there's some ideas. 
The other is just learning to hear. Birders often report, well, I, I say, did you hear that over there? No, I don't hear it. So then we stop. And the next time the bird says, and the next time it sounds, I go, and the next time it sounds, I go, and about the third or fourth time, the person says, oh yeah, I hear that. So it's partly training your ear to hear. So take a little time reading that section on your own sometime. All right, we've got a few minutes. Let's look at some types of bird songs. There's three main things that you hear over and over and over in different forms. One is a single whistle. Sometimes it's a shriek or a scream. Trills. These are repeated whistles, sometimes very fast, and warbles, which are, I don't know, a warble is a warble. We'll hear what they sound like. It's a very up and down all over the place kind of sound. So here's a Townsend solitaire. If you, if you take a drive, what, what is the, the name of the, I can't think of the name of the road, Myestis Road, where the reservoir is up there. If you take a drive on Myestis Road and stop, and listen out into the pinon juniper right now, you will hear this bird. This is a Townsend solitaire. It'll be sitting on the top of a juniper tree or a pinon tree, and it'll be making that single whistle. So you have single whistles. It's a very common sound. You have whistles that are not quite like that whistle. This is a black crown night heron. This is a bird that breeds at the Rio Fernando wetlands. You can hear this sound in the summer. And then a lot of people are familiar with the cry of a red tail hawk. that descending tree. Whenever, whenever you're listening to a movie, a Western or something, and they want to evoke sound out in the, that, that's the sound they use. It's the, the, the so a single whistle or now listen to this long dry trill of a chipping sparrow. Breathe, you can do it that fast. It's soft, long, dry trill, and that's how most books describe it a long, dry trill of a chipping sparrow. It's many individual whistles in a row. And here is a different version of a trill by the orange crowned warblers. And you'll notice here I say, yes, warblers don't warble. House finches warble, but not warblers. Warblers trill. They give individual whistles and they give fast trills. Here's a very subtle version of the long dry chipping sparrow trill, but it's the orange crown warbler. So it's, it's not too dissimilar from the chipping sparrow, but it descends at the end in pitch slightly. So the, it's both the intensity and the pitch drift downwards a little bit. So you've got whistles or shrieks and you've got repeated whistles turned into trills. And then you've got warbles. Now here's a warbling vireo. This is a bird song that, because there aren't too many songs right here in our location like that, you hear that much of that song and you know it's a warbling video. 
And when you look up, you'll see it's eyebrow and slide under eyebrow, and there it is. Our most widely heard bird that warbles. Just about everybody's heard this one, the house finch. It's a great warbler. Couple of notes, another note. The note followed by And during the breeding season, that song will usually have some kind of an uptick at the end of zzz, kind of going up a little bit. So if you're surprised about warblers not warbling, you can go over to All About Birds and listen to a few warblers. Most warbler songs consist of whistles, often at a fast pace and varied pitches and trills often very fast. So, got those three kinds of songs and they get combined in a bunch of different ways. Now, I want to look at one other song, which is the American Robin, because a lot of people know what the American Robin sounds like. The, it's, it's usually, the mnemonic for it is usually given as cheery up, cheerily, cheerio, cheery up, cheery up, whatever. Sometimes followed by a whinny, like a, like a horse neighing, a whinny. The, the reason that this is brought up is because there are numerous species, at least seven or eight species, that people commonly think of as being songs that sound like Robin. Western Bluebird, Mountain Bluebird, Townsend Solitaire, Western Tanager, Black-Headed Grosbeak, Plumbius Vireo. So I want to, this is, I think, a really useful exercise. I'm going to play the American Robin, which I think everybody's probably familiar with. So you get these individual little phrases. Very slightly separated. Now here is a song of the black-headed grosbeak. Let's just listen to it first. Now the phrases, sometimes called syllables, are quite similar to the syllables that the American Robin makes, except that this bird strings them all together and it goes on and on and on. So it's a little quicker and it's more continuous and it can go on for very long times. Now here is another bird. This is one of my favorite birds. I, I love this bird song. It is like, it has robin-like phrases, but they're separated by much longer pauses. So they're separated almost, you know, by a full second or, or a little bit more. Where the robin is, and the gross beak is. The gray vireo is just like this, but a little faster. It's kind of interesting. So 
All of this is aimed at just getting you to start listening. Listen, 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 and describe. Okay, just a couple of things. This section, mnemonics, another approach is given as part of the exercises for this week. There are things like, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? The white winged dove, the yellow warbler. Sweet, sweet, I'm so sweet. Sweet, sweet, I'm so sweet. Very up, very high. Lazuli bunting, paired notes. Fire, fire, where, where? Here, here, see? And the common yellow throat, that was the one, the little yellow word with the mask. Witchity, witchity, witchity. So in this exercise, I ask you to go over to All About Birds and listen to the songs of these and see how they fit with the mnemonics. It's a very useful way to, to memorize some bird songs. Now, the last thing I'll leave you with is this possibility of a spotted toey song immersion. If you want to get to, ingrained in your mind how the spotted toey sounds, because I can tell you whether you've heard them in the spring or not before, you're going to notice them this spring and you're going to hear them because they're a very common bird in northern New Mexico. And its song in, in the West is usually thought of as chup, 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 cheese, something on that order. Let's listen to it for a minute. The cheese, the cheese, the cheese. Drink your tea. If the bird was in the east, they would say, Drink your tea. The cheese. cheese. Cheese chop. There was that chuck cheese. Anyway, this recording goes on for 16 minutes. Uh, it was made on my front porch. Uh, it was made with just a simple point and shoot camera. And it just so happens that the, the corner acts kind of like a uh, sound gathering device and the bird liked to sing every morning near sun near sunrise right outside there. So you can listen to it, just use it as background to get that tonal quality built in. There was one thing I should point out. Uh, let's reset this. I just want to point out something. There's the video. Now, did anybody hear those? Mm, mm, mm. Let's go back there. Listen. Mm, dun, dun, dun. Almost sounds like a truck that's backing up. Here it comes. Let's do it one more time. Ma, ma, ma. Anyway, this is the kind of that that is a uh, red breasted um, uh, red breasted nuthatch singing in the background. Anyway, listen, listen closely. Um, I'm going to give you 30 seconds on behavior. Here's a long list of behaviors that I've listed, and you can just read them, think about them. I say in here, it's offered in, as an encouragement to pay attention to every aspect of the bird while you're bird watching. And the reality is that you're gonna have your own list very soon. You're gonna see, if you observe birds, you're gonna see interesting, very interesting behaviors. So we don't have time to go through them, but you can read this list and check it out. I think we're we're a couple minutes over, so we should stop. Thank you, Robert. Um, anybody have any questions you want to hit us with before um, before we call it a day?
All right. Um, well, let me just say one more thing. In the exercises for this week, the first one is go out birding. Make a list of the birds. Observe, work on it, make a list of the birds you see. And if you can't identify the bird, write down some questions and come back and study it and figure it out. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. It's fun. Thank you, Robert. I just put a link to, link to um, the, the website that Robert built. I just put it in there in the chat room again so you guys can go there and find your homework and all that kind of stuff. Um, and again, I will, uh, I will work to get these videos posted in case you want to watch them again or share them around. So um, thank you guys. And we'll do this again next Monday at 4 p.m. Same, same channel. All right. Thanks. Bye.